to his disciples, there was a rich man who had a manager and charges were brought to him that this man was wasting his possessions. And he called him and said to him, what is this that I hear about you? Turn in the account of your management for you can no longer be manager. And the manager said to himself, what shall I do? Since my master is taking the management away from me, I'm not strong enough to dig and I am ashamed to beg. I have decided what to do so that when I am removed from management, people may receive me into their houses. So summoning his master's debtors one by one, he said to the first, how much do you owe my master? He said, a hundred measures of oil. He's, he said to him, take your bill, sit down quickly and write 50. Then he said to another, and how much do you owe? He said, a hundred measures of wheat. He said to him, take your bill and write 80. The master commended the dishonest manager for his shrewdness. For the sons of the world are more shrewd in dealing with their own generation than the sons of light. And I tell you, make friends for yourself by means of unrighteous wealth, so that when it fails, they may receive you into the eternal dwellings. One who is faithful in a very little is also faithful in much. And one who is dishonest in a very little is also dishonest in much. If then you have not been faithful in the unrighteous wealth, who will entrust to you the true riches? And if you have not been faithful in that which is another's, who will give you that which is your own? No servant can serve two masters, for either he will hate the one and love the other, or he will be devoted to the one and despise the other. You cannot serve God and money. The Pharisees, who were lovers of money, heard all these things, and they ridiculed him. And he said to them, You are those who justify yourselves before men, but God knows your hearts. For what is exalted among men is an abomination in the sight of God. Thank you, Jim and Lori. Let's be seated and let's just pray for a few moments before this message. Let's bring our hearts, our, our hearts to the wonderful Lord Jesus. I don't know what the state of your heart is this morning, but I want to invite you to apply the gospel to it today. Jesus died on a cross for your sins. And he rose again from the dead for your life. Lord, we apply the wonders of the gospel to our, our lives, our hearts today. Lord, you know the state of each one of us. Maybe someone is here this morning with, really they've struggled with sin hugely. Maybe they've struggled with lust all week or unforgiveness or fear, or worry, Lord, may the wonders of the gospel that you died on a cross for those sins be applied to those hearts. Lord, maybe someone's come with a broken heart. Life's been tough. Oh, Lord, for the wonders of Christ crucified, sins forgiven, heaven awaiting, be applied to that heart today, Lord. Maybe someone's come full of questions, full of confusion. Lord, may they harbor their hearts today in the fact that Jesus died for their sins. And may that become the anchor of their confused heart. Lord, you know every situation. Maybe there's a father here this morning who feels totally inadequate as a dad. Lord, Today, may the wonders of the fact that Christ is sufficient for even his weaknesses touch his heart, Lord. We are your sheep, Lord. We are your little flock. It's us, Lord. Come and feed your lambs. Come and feed your lambs, Lord, we pray. In Jesus' name, amen. 
Well, welcome this morning. We could welcome many, but especially just Dean and Jennifer Tomlinson, previously youth pastors here, and they're visiting today. Can we welcome? And they are pastoring in Ch Cahokia. I want to say that right. Did I say that right, Dean? Cahokia, Missouri. Welcome. We're so glad you're here, and we trust that you will be wonderfully blessed just by being among us today. Well, I'm sure that uh, everybody has already understood this parable in Luke 16, and it requires virtually no explanation whatsoever. Uh, big context. Bad people, quote-unquote, are coming to Jesus, and the good people don't like it. Remember, we discovered that last week, and how wonderful it is, as Chad always uh, already said, that we have a Savior who welcomes sinners. Jesus is the bad person's God. Therefore, I'm qualified to come to Jesus. He's not the good person's God. Uh, Allah is the good person's God. Okay, go to the mosque, be with Allah, good person's God. If you're a bad person, come to the church, be with Jesus, bad person's God. Welcome sinners and eats with them. And in that context, he told us a story about a, a wasteful son who wasted his father's inheritance, then his older brother who wasted his relationship with his father, now a manager who wastes his boss's money. Waste, waste, waste. And the Pharisees are hearing all this, and this story that we are going to look at this morning ends with Jesus saying, you can't serve God and money, you can't do both. And the Pharisees, Luke tells us, who loved money, sneered at Jesus. And Jesus said to them, God knows your hearts, and they are detestable before God. Wow, that's not exactly Jesus being seeker sensitive, is he? And in the midst of this, he tells us this parable of this unrighteous, wasteful manager. And we get hung up in, in this parable, and we don't need to, because it's actually profoundly simple. And it's very instructive and very helpful, but it does deal with our money. And Jesus talks about money more than almost any other subject. And our money needs to be brought under the lordship of Jesus. And this strikes nerves with all of us. Some of us here this morning are really struggling financially because we have lots of money. And Jesus says it's really hard to go to heaven if you have lots of money. Jesus said that, didn't he? Some of us here are really struggling financially because we, we don't have very much money and things are really tough. And we all need to get to a place where our, our money is baptized. The story is told of a man who was baptized and came out of the water and realized, dang, I had my wallet in my pocket. That's a good thing to make sure your finances are baptized and they're under the lordship of Jesus. So we come to this parable, and it's this parable of this manager who is wasting his boss's possessions. This is relived every day in the news today. This is totally up to date right now. Now, I find it's really important when I read the parables of Jesus to make sure I don't make the mistake of confusing a parable with an allegory. An allegory is a story where absolutely everything has a meaning, right? So the cheese stands for this, and the clock stands for that, and the pickle stands for this over here, and you've got to figure all that out. Parables aren't like that. Parables are far more simple. Parables basically have one great message. And so you don't have to try to figure out, well, what does this little word over here exactly stand for? You don't have to do that with parables. And this parable actually has a very simple message for you and for me. The problem is, is that Jesus is using three scoundrels who we would never want to be like to teach us a lesson. And we think, how can Jesus do that? 
Well, because the world actually has a lot to teach us. We can actually learn an awful lot of things by the way the world operates because the world gets things about money that we don't get. Sometimes Christians get super spiritual and in getting super spiritual we miss the obvious and we don't become as useful as we could be. In 1886, an Atlanta pharmacist named John Pemberton created a new drink. You know where I'm going, some of you, and he mixed it with carbonated water and began selling it. That first year, he averaged selling nine servings per day. Today, 1.9 billion Cokes will be sold on earth. 1.9 billion Cokes will be sold on earth today. You cannot, I, I can almost say, you cannot find a spot on earth where you can't buy a Coke. But 2 billion people have never heard about Jesus. What does the world get that we don't get? Why is the world so good at something that we're not nearly as good of? Why do successes in the worldly realm seem to happen so easily and gather so much applause and somehow Christian work seems to lag way behind? Well, Jesus wants to teach us about that. So the story has three characters. One is a manager. He's a poor steward. He's wasted his manager's possessions. His possessions weren't his. They belonged to the manager. He was a steward of them. Same is true with us. We own nothing in this world. Nothing in this world. We are stewards. God owns it all. We manage it. This guy is lazy because he says, I'm not strong enough to dig. Of course he is. He can dig something. But he's lazy. And I'm too proud to beg, so he's, he, he's proud. He's lazy and he's proud, and he knows he's about to lose his job. His days are numbered. He's going to get fired. And then we have debtors. Now, two are mentioned, but there were probably lots. And these debtors are more than happy to enter into the scheme. So the manager comes to one debtor, and he says, well, uh, how much do you owe? And he says, I owe 800 gallons of oil. And the manager says, quick, cut it in half. Well, the debtor is a creep. He's also a scoundrel. He's willing to cook the books for his own sake. The other one, how much do you owe? A thousand bushels of wheat. And he says, take your bill and make it 800. So here is a manager who's a scoundrel. Here are debtors who are scoundrels. And here comes the boss. Verse 8. The master commended the dishonest manager because he acted shrewdly. So the master's even a scoundrel. Even the master says, well, that was, that was pretty good work. I like that. So you have a parable here with creeps. They're all complicit in dishonesty. None of them fear God. None of them care about eternity. They are what Jesus later calls in this parable, people of the world. Okay? They're, they're not conscious of heaven. They're not conscious of eternity. They're living just for this life. They're making their decisions solely on what will work best in this life. i got to take care of tomorrow. And this manager is thinking, I'm going to lose my job. I've got money right now. So how can I use this money that I have right now to help enhance my future? That's what he says. That's his thought process. How can I use what I have now for tomorrow? Because I'm going to be in trouble tomorrow. And what I have now is soon to go. And the manager, or the, rather the owner, commends him for that. Now, it's 
important in verse 8. It doesn't say that Jesus commended him for his dishonesty. The manager commended him for his dishonesty. Jesus is just telling the story. And this kind of stuff happens all the time. This is daily news, isn't it? Schemes and pyramid schemes, and this is happening and that's happening. Someone's getting found out. Someone's going to prison. Someone's in trouble. Happens all the time. The problem is Jesus uses them as an example for us. I think, how can Jesus do that? How can Jesus use such scandalous events as an example for how Christians should act? Well, it comes down to two things, and it's two very simple lessons that Jesus wants us to learn. Very, very simple. Look what he says in verse 8 and 9. The master commended the dishonest manager because he had acted shrewdly. Now here's the word. For the people of this world are more shrewd, word can be translated wiser or prudent, the people of this world are more shrewd in dealing with their own kind, their own generation, than are the people of light. I tell you, use worldly wealth to gain friends for yourselves so that when it is gone, you will be welcomed into eternal dwellings. Two things Jesus wants us to learn, and we should have great fun with this. This is so freeing and so good, and we should enjoy what Jesus is going to teach us. Here's the first thing that the unrighteous steward gets that we need to get. Remember, the world gets this stuff better than we get it. This is, this is how they operate. The first lesson is this. Present wealth will soon be no more. That's the first obvious lesson here. And the steward got it. I'm about to lose my money. Present wealth will soon be no more. I cannot trust that this will always be here. As a matter of fact, I am certain that one day it won't be here. The book of Proverbs says, Proverbs chapter 23 verse 4, do not wear yourselves out to get rich. Have wisdom to show restraint. Cast but a glance at riches and they are gone. They will surely sprout wings and fly away like an eagle. Well, the steward gets the fact that what I have now I'm not going to have soon. Christians need to understand that our money, our talents, our beauty, our strength, our abilities are all very temporal. We have them, but they're not going to last. And one day they're all going to be gone. You young folks here with your incredible young natural strength, you won't have it forever. I'll be in heaven with a glorified body laughing at you <laughs> even as you are laughing at me now. And I'll be rejoicing in that. Your talents, your beauty, your strength, your abilities, all these things that the world understands or that this, this man understood I'm about to lose, we need to learn this lesson from him. The second clear and obvious lesson, and he gets it, is that present wealth, though transitory and though leaving me, can be used now to secure future blessings. Present wealth, money, talents, beauty, strength, abilities can be used now to secure future blessings. The manager's future in this parable, his future is really just next week or next month or maybe next year. That's as far as he sees. Our future extends into eternity. 
That's the big difference. All the manager is thinking about is, where am I going to sleep next weekend? I'm about to lose my house. I need to make some friends fast. What the sons of light, children of light, need to think about is, I have eternal life by grace, through faith, through the gospel of Jesus. My future goes into eternity. So how can I use what I have now to enhance forever? Okay, let's make something really clear. Jesus is not teaching here that you can buy heaven. But you can enhance heaven. He is teaching that. You can't buy heaven. We receive salvation solely by grace. We believe the gospel. We receive the gospel. Oh, my sins are forgiven. I hope you've done that. And if you did it a long time ago, I hope you're living in the wonders of it today. My sins are forgiven. I've been given the gift of eternal life. No, we cannot buy heaven. But we can certainly enhance it. Listen to what Jesus said in Matthew chapter 6. Matthew chapter 6, verses 19 and 20. Do not store up for yourselves treasures on earth where moth and rust destroy and where thieves break in and steal, but store up for yourselves treasures in heaven where moth and rust do not destroy, where thieves do not break in and steal, for where your treasure is, there will your heart be also. It's a very similar thing that Jesus is saying there. We can actually invest in eternity. And how we use our money is a profound indication of where our hearts are. Because Jesus says where your treasure is, your hearts go first. So actually we go to heaven in four stages. First we put our treasure there. Secondly, our hearts follow. Third, when we die, our spirits are with the Lord. And fourth, at the end of time, our bodies are resurrected in glory. Four stages. Stages one and two need to happen now. Now again, Jesus in not saying that we can buy heaven is not saying that we can't affect heaven. Why are the sons of this world who cannot see past this world, how can they be so happy about prizes and victories and so creative in how they act and their finances and their endeavors and so daring and so willing and the sons of light, that's us, who have eternity, be so hesitant to rejoicingly live and give all for Jesus. The kingdom of God will not be served by our spare change and our spare time and our cast-offs. The sons of this world are giving their best to things that won't last while we give our second best to things that will last. And it doesn't make sense. The sons of, of this earth give their wealth for selfish gains. Should we not give ours for eternal blessings? Now look what Jesus says. I tell you, use worldly wealth. Use it. Isn't that wonderful? Don't worship it, don't love it, don't bank on it, but use it to gain friends for yourselves. What's he mean? Does he, does he, are we supposed to bribe people? No, he doesn't mean that. I am certain he's talking about world missions here. He's talking about affecting other lives with what we have. So that when it fails... You will be welcomed into eternal dwellings. Okay, I want you to imagine this scene with me. I spent some time with Tony Marshall this week talking about this passage. And he, he helped me understand some, some beautiful things about it. Uh, do you know that this church, Westbrook Church, 
completely supports a school in Haiti that has 500 students in it. Did you know we do that? We pay the teachers, we feed the kids, we help clothe the kids, we help support the kids. 500 students. This church does this. All of July you're going to hear about Haiti in this church. Now I want you to imagine one day you're in heaven by the grace of God. Saved by the grace of God. You are in heaven. And you know, Jesus did say he is building our dreams there, isn't he? Right? I hope you're not trying to build your dream home on earth because Jesus has it all sorted. Okay? So imagine that there you are and, and there's this, this gorgeous home. And out comes uh, a woman. And she says, uh, are you Tim Tossig? I'm picking on you, Tim, because you can handle this. She says, Tim, I'm, I don't know, Susie from Haiti. Tim, you helped me know Jesus. You helped my child get an education. You, you helped me discover the love of God because you gave, you used unrighteous mammon for a glorious purpose and you help me welcome into my dwelling come in can you imagine such a glorious scene you're loving your neighbor you're extending what you have you're using your talents your gifts your money your purposes whatever you have for something bigger than yourself in the name of Jesus and Jesus says when your temporal things are gone. You'll be welcomed into eternal dwellings. Can you imagine going to heaven? And there's, I don't know, somebody from India. And with wisdom you gave to missions there. With wisdom. And here they come and they say, it's you. It's, it's Jeff. It's Jake. It's, it's Barbara. Come in. It's my dwelling. You were part of this being established. It's exactly the picture here. Because the unwise manager, the, the, the scoundrel, purchased dwellings for himself while he could. And Jesus said, we can do that. I'm not in any way trying to suggest that heaven is about getting worldly wealth. It's about relational wealth. It's about the joy of seeing that what we did with our little lives impacted so many people. I want to be a part of world missions. I want to no profound eternal joy and have the satisfaction of knowing, you know, somehow by the grace of God I contributed to this. Me, me of all people, glory to God, all glory to Him. Of all people, I contributed to this. Imagine what heaven's going to be like. Heaven's going to be relationships. It's not going to be floating around on a cloud playing a harp. It's going to be people, redeemed people in the presence of God forever. And Jesus says, I tell you, use your worldly wealth. Use it. So that when it fails, because it will, you will be welcomed into eternal dwellings. That should excite us. That should thrill us. And that's the parable of the scoundrels here. It's as simple as that. Jesus wants us to learn two things from these scoundrels. Money will leave and money can be used. They use it for the weekend. We use it for eternity. And we will see glorious things because of it. Brothers and sisters, the sons of this world give their best for things that won't last. There is an urgency and a creativity and a daring to people who don't even know Jesus. Can't there be amongst us for the kingdom, for eternity? 
it was said, and I've never checked it out to know if it's exactly true, but it was said that when John Wesley, the great Methodist founder in the 18th century, was a young man, he, he had very, very little money as a, as a young clergyman, but he was careful to tithe what he had. As he grew, he be, actually became very wealthy because he published a lot. Became very, very wealthy, and his standard of living never changed. It was his standard of giving that changed. He said at the end of his life, if when I die I have more than 10 pounds to my name, which was a lot of money in those days. It wasn't nothing. But he said, if I have more than 10 pounds to my name, call me a thief and a liar. May the Lord Jesus give us grace to think in light of eternity. The Bible does not forbid the creation of wealth. It encourages it. The Bible does not forbid the saving of money. It says in the book of Proverbs, a wise man saves for his children's children. Doesn't forbid that. But the Bible does encourage us, urgently encourages us to wisely sow into eternity and have fun doing it. And think to ourselves, you know, when you write that check for missions, no, no, man, I've got to write a check for missions. Think to yourself, I'm investing in eternity. I'm using what I one day won't have for the glory of forever. And I'm enhancing the kingdom. And I'm going to rejoice in that. I'll be given eternal joy in that. So, Jesus says in verse 10, whoever can be trusted with very little can also be trusted with much. See that in verse 10. The very little in context is worldly wealth. The much in context is eternal blessing. But whoever is dishonest with very little will be dishonest with much. Therefore, we won't get much. So, very little, that's called worldly wealth. Now, I don't know what your financial situation is, but God does and you do. And that's what you need to be concerned about. But whatever it is, Jesus calls it very little. Whatever it is. And if, you're not, if I'm not faithful with my very little, it's going to affect my very much. Now, oh dear, I know I'm almost sounding like a prosperity preacher. I hate the prosperity gospel. It is not the gospel. It uses Jesus as a means to an end, the end being my health and comfort. I don't mean that in any way. But I do mean this. I need to be faithful with what Jesus has been given to me. And if I am faithful with what Jesus has been given to me, one day I will be given more blessing than I can imagine. And it will all be to the glory of God. It will not be a Bentley in heaven. It will be people that I relate to in the name of Jesus, in the glory of God, and in the presence of Christ. It will be my capacity for joy, gloriously enhanced. So I tell you, verse 11, if you've, if you've not been trustworthy with handling worldly wealth, who will trust you with true riches? Do you see that in verse 11? Worldly wealth versus true riches. So here's worldly wealth. Now, I realize there's some of us in this church that have a lot of worldly wealth, some of us who are really struggling right now. Don't let Jesus condemn you if you're really struggling, and don't get proud if you're doing really well. Timothy was told by Paul, command those who are rich to put their trust in God. It's hard to command rich people really hard. Paul says to Timothy, command them. Put your trust in God. 
We need to say, Lord, make me faithful with my worldly wealth. And I'm going to give a very fast teaching about that in just a moment. So that one day I can be entrusted with true riches. True riches. So let's just say, for sake of argument, that you have $25 million invested. Jesus calls that little worldly wealth and not true riches. That's what Jesus calls it. The world doesn't call it that. The world calls it lots and real wealth. Jesus says, use it. Use it. And in God's economy, because we're going to discover in a few weeks about a woman who put two pennies in the offering, and Jesus said, you see that? She put in more than all the others. So in God's math... So let's pretend instead of having 25 million, you got virtually not, nothing. But what you have, you give to Christ and to the kingdom. And you find ways to serve. Jesus sees it. And in Jesus' way of doing math, it's more than the other. So if you've not been trustworthy in handling worldly wealth, who will entrust you with true riches? Verse 12. And if you've not been trustworthy with someone else's property, that's all we have right now. We're just stewards. Who will give you property of your own? One day we will have property of our own. No thief can steal it. Rust won't destroy it. Moth can't eat it. But Jesus is saying that what we do here is incredibly important. Our use of money is a profound barometer of our souls. If you let me see, somebody said, if you let me see, in those days it was your canceled checks, but nowadays it would be maybe your credit card statement, I'll show you who your God is. And then Jesus says these words, verse 13, no one can serve two masters. You've tried, haven't you? I've tried. It is exhausting. It's exhausting to try to serve two masters. To try to serve God and money wears people out. Either you will hate one and love the other or be devoted to one and despise the other. You cannot serve both God and money. So what do we do? We're the richest people history has ever seen, aren't we? We are incredibly blessed. When my father was a little boy in South Arkansas in 1930, his goal in life, his goal in life, this is true, was to have a freezer with a Milky Way bar in it. He said, if, I, if I, do, I will be a success. And we've always kept a Milky Way bar, bar in our freezer, just to remember that. They could not imagine what we have. So what do we do? How do we make sure that we are investing in eternity in such a way that when money fails, we'll be welcome into eternal dwellings. Won't it be fun, by the way, when someone from Uganda that you wisely gave to says, come into my house. I've been waiting to see you. Remember when you gave that $5? I, I used that to buy food that week for my child. Come into my house. Well, I leave you with the wisdom of John Wesley. John Wesley uh, had a sermon on the proper use of money, and he had three rules for the proper use of money. Three really simple rules, and keeping these rules will help us make sure we're not serving two masters, but we're, we're sanctifying our finances for God. Here is three rules. Rule number one, make all you can. Wow. Wow. That's kind of freeing, isn't it? Wesley said, make all the money you can, but he said it this way, without breaking the law of God, or harming yourself, or harming your neighbor. 
In other words, do not do something that is going to offend God, yourself, or your neighbor. That being, use everything God has given you to make all you can. That's being a good steward. So if I have the ability to make X, but through laziness I only make X divided by 2, I'm not honoring God. Or if I have the ability to make X, but if through offending God, myself, or my neighbor, I can make 2X, I'm not honoring God. Make everything you can. God's given us the ability to generate wealth. Number two, his second rule, save everything you can. Save everything you can. In other words, and when you read the whole sermon, he's preaching against frivolous spending. We are, we are to be stewards. We are to be wise. We are not just to blow money all over the place. And I'll tell you, it is so easy to do today, isn't it? We are provoked everywhere to spend. Everywhere. So Wesley says, you know, you need to be prayerful with your spending. Save everything. In. Make everything you can. Save everything you can. And number three, can you guess what number three is? Give. Everything you can. Give everything you can. Just become an extravagant giver. And those are simply his rules for money. And I believe that if, if you and I take those to heart, prayerfully before God, and say, Lord, show me how to make everything I can without offending you, harming myself, or harming my neighbor. Show me how to do it, Lord. And I know some of us right now, maybe things are really tough, but just start praying that prayer. Show me how to do it, Lord. Show me how to be creative in this. And then number, number two, Lord, show me how to save. Lord, deliver me from the frivolous frittering of money that abounds in our age because I want to live for eternity, Lord. I want my life to count. Do you know, I think each generation has phenomenal blind spots. Uh, one thing that's always really amazed me was that 250 years ago, the incredibly godly George Whitfield kept slaves. One of, the, one of the great men of history kept slaves. True biblical Christian. And I've often thought, how, how, how could he have been blind there? I sometimes think that maybe 200 years from now, people will look back on us and think, how could they have wasted so much money? They just had so much. That generation that lived in the 70 or so years after World War II just had so much. They wasted a lot of it. Lord, help me to be wise. Help me to be budgeted. Help me to spend in light of eternity. Finally, three, help me to give all I can. Lord, show me. Show me wise ways to give. Wise mission endeavors to support my local church, to support missionaries, to support things so that when my money fails, I'll be welcomed into eternal dwellings. Now, the Pharisees who loved money, and Jesus said you can't love money and God, sneered at this. But Jesus says, you're the ones who justify yourselves in the eyes of men, but God knows your hearts. And what's highly valued among men, well, what's highly valued among men? Rich, riches. Riches without a thought of eternity. Jesus says that's detestable before God. Brothers and sisters, it's my hope that we discover in this teaching from Luke 16, wonderful freedom. Wonderful freedom. Freedom to say, Jesus, thank you for the temporal blessings you are giving me. And if you don't have a lot of money, you've got a lot of other blessings. I'll guarantee you you don't. But they will all go away one day. So thank you, Lord, for showing me now 
that I can use these now to affect eternity. We are not just living for this world, brothers and sisters. Amen? We're living for forever. And we want to enhance heaven. We want to see others there who aren't going to be there if we don't live for missions and for the gospel. So here's what I'd like us to do. I'd like us to bow our heads and close our eyes and bring ourselves to God over this. Let's just do this right now. Just bring your bank accounts, your jobs, maybe your unemployment. Bring your portfolio. Bring your talents and your gifts and your abilities that God has given you today. Bring them to Jesus. Lord, we come to you right now. Lord, thank you that Jesus says to us, use worldly wealth. What a wonderful thing to say. Thank you that Jesus says to us, you'll be welcomed into eternal dwellings. Lord, may our imagination just run with that a moment. How wonderful. How wonderful. Jesus, thank you for teaching us through three scoundrels how to live for eternity, how to use money today. And Lord, again, you know our needs and you know our situations. And Lord, I'm aware that there are some of us in this church that are really hurting financially. Lord, would you give them wisdom and grace to make all they can. Show them how to do it, Lord, please. And when they do, Lord, as many of us who are doing well, give us wisdom and grace to save all we can. Deliver us from the frivolous frittering of what you've given us. That is all over our generation, Lord. And then, Lord, show us with excitement how to give all we can, how to invest in eternity, Lord. Show us with excitement. Give us joy in this, Lord. May it be a a fun, happy, glorious thing to do, Lord. And, Lord, we just want to thank you this morning, before we close, for being so wonderful. And for talking to us about this, Lord. Deliver us from being wasteful and make us faithful that one day we might be welcomed into eternal dwellings. In Jesus' name.